So we just talked about last class is actually called a limit. So we call this a limit. So limit is very different than the English version of limit. So when we think of limit, we probably think of speed limit, or maybe blood alcohol limit, something like that, whatever limit you're thinking of at the moment. Uh, so the way you've been thinking about limits is something you don't go past, right? Nobody drives faster than 70 miles an hour on I-5, so it's a number you don't go past. Never. Never. Absolutely. When you were driving below 70, I passed you also doing below 70. So uh, that's what limits have been in English. So these limits are going to be completely different. So these are numbers you could definitely go past, uh, either way, above or below. But the idea is, with this limit, is something that you're getting close to, something you're approaching. So approaching is a really important word, or getting close. Those are ways you want to think about limits. So we wrote this down here, approaches. So I already wrote that word. As x approaches 1, what happens to y? y approaches 2. So these arrows, these arrows here means they mean approaches. So as x is getting close to 1, y is getting close to 2. So if I write this out in English, let's do it in math first, as x approaches. Now, what we just wrote down, when x approaches on the positive or the negative side, you approach 2, no matter which way you're going. So I can uh, take both cases, and I can just say as x approaches 1 from either direction, y approaches 2. And that's our math sentence right there. If we write, so this is written out in math. And it doesn't ever touch the it, it could, but that's irrelevant to the limit. So the limit just talks about getting close to. So when x is close to 1, y is getting close to 2. This doesn't say anything about when x equals 1. So approaches, but doesn't matter what happens if x equals 1. So we're just looking, approaching, getting close to. I know there was both the hole there at 2, um, but could you say that with anything, like as x approaches 3, y approaches 9? Uh, as x approaches 3, y approaches yeah, whatever, it probably would be 4 or something. Yeah, I could do that with any other x value, but in this function it wouldn't be very exciting. Because it would be very boring, you would say, oh, it approaches that value. Right. And I could have taken any, you know, if I extend this, I think I had a larger graph. I could have taken any x value here. For example, negative 1. That's pretty easy to look at. What happens as x approaches negative 1? What can you say about y? Approaches zero. Y approaches 0. So a lot of these are going to be really boring. I can do that with any. Uh, I could go over here to 2. And I want to look up here, and I think we should be at 3 at that point. So I can say, what if x approaches 2, y is going to approach 3. So just look at where something interesting happens on the graph. Yeah, and we're going to get to continuity, which is uh, this function is continuous except at that point that we removed. So the idea of the limit matching the value is continuity. So and that, I think that's 2, 3, somewhere. It's coming up very soon we'll have continuity. 2, 2, at uh, some point in the future we'll get to continuity. Alright, so that's written out in math. In English, you would write as x approaches 1, y approaches 2. So that would be in English. Why do we capitalize English and not math? That's a good question. I think it was they made up the rules. All right. Y approaches 2. So we get even lazier in the math world. So here is the notation we're going to use. So in, if you wrote this out in English, we would say it would be the 
limit i the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 2. So what happens to f of x when x approaches 2? The answer is it approaches 2. Yeah, x should be approaching 1. Ooh. So as x approaches 1, f of x, or the y value, approaches 2. So this last one is the notation we're going to use. Our particular f of x was, I think it was x squared minus 1 over x, was it x minus 1 or x plus 1? Somewhere, x minus 1. So if we write out with our particular f of x, we got that right there. <clears throat> so nowhere above in any of those English or math descriptions did I ever say what happens when x equals 1. So nowhere up there did I make a claim when x equals 1. So, so is not relevant. Does relevant have an A or an E? V relevant? I think that's right. So x equals 1 is not relevant. So it doesn't matter what happens when x equals 1, only when it's close. Yeah, that's why you don't want to think of limit like the English version of limit, which is like, you can't go there, you can't do that. Okay. We use limit, uh, in math that word would be boundary. Yeah. Or maximum or something like that. It would not be, limit is not, doesn't have the same meaning in English. So in that sense it's probably not the best word yeah. uh, to use. Or maybe English is wrong, one of the two. <laughs> English is wrong. English is wrong. All right, so x equals 1 is not relevant. So if you have lim x approaches a, f of x equals l. So this means x approaches a. It doesn't mean x equals a, so it means approaches. This means f of x will approach the value l. So if you want, you optionally could write x not equal to a on your limits. You don't need to write that, but if you want to, just as like a note to yourself, you can write x is not actually equal to a. It's just going to be close. All right, so that should be a thought in your brain right there. So that's a little thought bubble. You're not going to see that written down in textbooks or probably anywhere else. So we'll look at some functions and their limits. So these are called special functions and their limits. So this function f of x equals x is called the identity function. All right, what kind of graph does f of x have? f of x equals x, what kind of graph does that make? It's called a line, slope 1, y-intercept 0. 
All right, you've seen lines before. This is a much easier function than one we just graphed, and you were okay with that. All right, I'll graph it super easy. Well, let's pretend like I went through the origin. All right, you got some value x right here. What y value, if we're getting close to that x value, what y value will we be getting close to? Same. Same one. So, so there's x equals a. We're getting close to that. So what y value do we get close to? Value will be a. So in this one, we're going to get a for our uh, y value limit right there. So there's our identity limit. Limit as x approaches a of x equals a. So that one's pretty easy to see on the graph. Doesn't matter what x value you choose of x. If I chose one over here, negative, no problem. I'd be at the same, whatever the x coordinate would be, the same, uh, the y coordinate would be the same thing. All right, so that's the identity function. Now we'll do one even easier. f of x equals c. So c is a number. So c is a constant. What type of graph does f of x equal a number make? Straight line. What type? Well, <coughs> all lines are straight. What type of straight line? Horizontal. So it's a function. So it can't be vertical. So it's going to be horizontal. So all your y values are always c, 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 always. Whatever your x value is, doesn't matter. Y value is always c. Uh, I'm going to graph it not on an x, y axis, because if I put on x, y axis, we'll assume it's positive or negative. So I'm just going to graph it out like this. Does it matter, as far as the y value is concerned, does it matter what uh, x value we're using? No. It's always going to be c. So this is an even easier limit. Lim x approaches a of c is always c. Doesn't matter what x value you're getting close to, your y value is always going to be c. So there's two special easy functions and their limits. And now we're going to graph some step functions. So I'm concerned at 0 and around 0. I want to know what is the y value at 0, what is the limit if you approach on the left, what's the limit if you approach on the right. So the first one we'll do, f of x equals, so we have a step function. It's either going to be 0 or 1. 0 if x is less than 0, 1 if x is greater than or equal to 0. All right, graph this out. It's pretty easy to graph. We just have to be a little bit careful. So if you're less than 0, your x value is less than 0, your y value is 0. And if you have 0 or more, your y value is 1. So any questions on the graph of this function? So I want you to find these three values right now. If I plug in 0, what do I get? I don't really even need to look at the graph. I can look at the function itself. Uh, and then, so I want you to answer these three. And all the answers are either 0 or 1. You just have to put zeros or 1s in the right place. So answer it right now.
So you should get 101. Most scenic drive you can probably take. All right, 101. How do we get the first one? So you plug in zero for x. That means we're using, in this case, piece two. So x equals zero. We are satisfying that condition. And so we're going to use one. So that didn't require calculus whatsoever. The next part, from negative land, where, what y value do we approach? So we want to go approach zero from negative land. And our y value is zero, 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 zero. It should go the other way. Zero, 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 zero the whole way. Now, does it matter what happens when x equals zero for this limit? No, it doesn't. Remember, limits, if you want, you can write x is approaching 0, but not equal to 0. x is approaching 0, but not equal to 0. So you don't want to think about x equaling 0. You want to think about x getting close to 0, x approaching 0. So we approach on the left side. Looking at the graph, we got 0 the whole way. These are all y values of 0. So all along here, these are all y values of 0. Now, if we approach on the right side, it's this direction, we are using y values of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 the entire way. The fact that we're 1, that we are actually 1 at 0, when x is 0, that's not relevant to the limit. So when we approach, we always have 1. These are all y values of 1 the whole way. So that's why a uh, limit from the right side will be 1. And limit on the left side, these are all zeros. So we're going to approach zero. So any questions on 101? All right, next example, we'll do, we'll call this one g of x. So it'll either be one, of one or two. One if x is not zero. Two if x equals zero. And I want you to graph this function and then find, you can find g of zero without the graph, but I want you to use the graph for these two limits. x approaches zero from the negative side. Lim x approaches zero from the positive side. So go ahead, graph this function out. I'll give you one point when x is 0, y is 2. So that'll be 2 right there. So there's one point to start out your graph. Fill in the rest of your graph. Talk to your neighbors if you want to, if you're not sure how to graph this step function. Somebody sitting right next to you should probably know if you're unsure. We'll give you 30 seconds to graph it and then answer these questions. So there's our graph. You're always 1, except at the y value, uh, or at the x value of 0, you're going to jump up to 2. So your graph's almost the horizontal line, y equals 1. Just one point is moved off of there. So that means our g of 0 is 2. That's our single point that's up there. So approaching 0 on the left, we're going to have the y value is always 1 right there. Approach 0 on the right from positive land. Y values always 1 on that side. So we got 1 on both sides. So we can put these two together. And we can say that the limb, because it doesn't matter which side we approach 0, you get the same y value. So because they match up, I can put them together and say that the limit of g of x as x approaches 0 
is equal to 1. I can only do that because they match. So I can do this when left limit equals right limit. You can say the limit exists. So, no questions on the 2, 1, 1. Um, yeah. Will we have middle limits as we go on? Uh, or well, so do you mean, so you get two-sided limits and you can have a value? I mean, if we have two points that are, let's say, for this one, if we have, say, 0 and, let's say, 3 that are 2. When x is zero. That would be two separate limits. You'd have one x approaching 0, one of them would be x approaching 3. Okay. Um, I think this is something stupidly simple, but can you explain the g of 0 equals 2? Sure. I can explain it without the graph. What happens when x is 0 in this function? So are you just looking at a like point like x is 0 and y is 2? So when x is 0, I just see I'm in the second piece when x is 0. So y is 2. And then when x is not 0, we're in the f piece 1, which is always y value 1. If you had like a three step function, there's two limits then, right? There, most there, pro there would be most likely two points that would be interesting to ask limit questions on. Yeah. So generally, when I'm gluing together piecewise functions, I will generally ask about the place where they are actually glued together. And if there's three pieces, there's probably two places that are interesting. And in fact, I think I give sometimes a question, which of the two uh, maybe the limits don't match on, or something like that. So there could be questions where there's two places that two functions meet, and maybe one of them they meet uh, in a nice way, another one they don't meet in a nice way. And you have to figure out which, which one's meeting in which way. Along those lines, when you are piecing them together for your limits, do you go, do you write them like this, or do you write them slightly different in order to account for, say, the middle piece only going from one point to another? Uh, I'm not sure about your question. I mean, generally, I'll write them like this right here. Okay. If there's two x values, I'll write a limit for each of the different x values. Okay. So we're going to look at limit laws now. So we're going to suppose L, M, and C are real numbers. So we'll write that in a mathy way. Now I've talked about the backward, that little uh, epsilon next to the real numbers. So all this says is L, M, and C are real numbers. And lim x approaches c, f of x equals l, and lim x approaches c. All right, so we're starting out with this supposition, and we're going to write some rules based on this. So I'll go with some rule. So if you have limit of this function f plus a function g, then and you want to know what happens when x approaches c, well, all you have to do is basically take the limit separately. So this is lim x approaches c f of x plus lim x approaches c g of x, which we said were l and m. So you just add those two numbers together. That's going to be your sum rule. Difference exactly the same thing. 
up minus. So I'll just skip to the, not do the intermediate step and just write, that's gonna be L minus M. So some difference product Anybody feeling brave and want to guess what the product limit will be? Yep, the product, L times M. And quotient. What do I need to be careful about with the quotient? M cannot be a zero. Yep, make sure you don't divide by zero. So it's not gonna work if you're, so this works when M is not zero. If M equals zero, it is more complicated. And we'll deal with plenty of those cases, but you can't just use the quotient rule. I should not call this the quotient rule, the quotient law. So if you took a calculus class before, you probably saw the product rule and quotient rule. Those are rules for derivatives, which we will certainly get to. But these are not derivatives. I haven't said that word, except for the fact that I just said it, but I didn't really say it. And we'll get to it soon. These are not the product quotient rules that you've heard about. These are the limit laws. So product quotient, constant multiple, and the power rule and the root rule. Yeah, so a constant multiple rule. You really could get the constant multiple rule right off the product. Ooh, I need another letter. I need an A. So I will on purpose bring the A outside. So this is A times L. So a limit of a constant times a function, you could bring the constant in front of the limit. So in red, I'll write what you're not allowed to do. So here I brought a product through the limit. Why is this one bad, but the one I wrote in black down here is good? Not a constant. So if it's not a constant, do not bring it through the limit. So over here, this is bad. You cannot pass a something that's going to change through a limit. So it's not constant, so you're not allowed to just bring it outside the limit. If it's a number, no problem. All right, so there's a little wrong math. So our proper constant multiple rule, uh, we have our power rule. So we'll go to powers. So one way to write this, you can just take the limit and then apply the nth power. Now I have to be a little bit careful. Can you think of a number raised to a power that's not real? 
So negative anything raised to what power? Even. I could square negative one. Third power is okay. Fourth. I think anything with an even denominator, it's so like a half power, a quarter power, a sixth power, eighth power, tenth power, would all be imaginary. So this will make sense when L to the n power is real. So as long as that's real, you're okay. So you don't want I in your function? Well, it probably won't show up as i, but for example, square root x, uh, if I took the limit as x approaches negative 1, that's not, well, first of all, it's not in the domain. But uh, that would be an example where it won't, there won't be an i in there directly. Um, but there's, that's an x to the 1 half power. So you'd have to be careful about negative x values here. So we call this keeping it real. So as long as you keep it real. Keep it real. Okay. Powers. Oh, I didn't say anything about n. n could be any uh, constant number, any real number. It's pretty boring if n is 0. What is almost any number raised to the 0 power? 1. What's the one number you can't really raise to a zero power? Zero. zero is correct. What's zero to the zero power? Is it zero? Does it follow that rule? Or is anything to the zero power is always one? Except zero to any power is always zero. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So what am I talking about? Who knows? So that's always one, right? When x is not zero. And one raised to the x power is always what? So you have a problem when both, you make both of them zero. Which, which way do you go? Wait. No, that's right. Is that right? Oh, what I, that's not relevant. 0 to the x equals 0. That's the one I need. So what's 0 to the 0 power? Which, which rule does it follow? The answer is it doesn't follow either rule because we're breaking those two right there. All right, so you have to wait till calculus 2. Is that right, calc 2? Yes, yeah, calc 2. The answer is there is no answer. I believe it depends on which way you approach zero, positive or negative. Is that right? I don't know. You have to use natural logs, which I can't tell you about until you know integration. So you have a lot of a lot to go before we can talk about that in a constructive way. So I think that's all the limit rules we need for now. We're going to apply them. So using limit rules, which we just wrote down. Now I wrote the word explicitly. So it doesn't mean with expletives. It can mean it with expletives, but it's not usually how we use it. So we mean, in this case, very carefully. So we're going to very carefully use the rules that we just wrote down, or the laws we just wrote down. We're going to use them explicitly. So what does that mean? Well, we got thing plus another thing plus or minus another thing. So I'm going to use the sum difference rule for limits first. So it's going to seem very tedious to keep having to rewrite lim, 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 lim.
Oop, last one is minus. Not plus, minus. All right, so all I did was use the sum difference rule on limits. So our sums turn into the sum of limits, and our minus sign or difference turn into minus a limit. So that was basically just law one and law two, sum difference. One of these three limits you can do right away. What is the last limit, limit of three? Constant rule. No, constant rule, where are those? There they are, limit of three is three. Doesn't matter, in this case, doesn't matter what x value I approach. That's not relevant, it's always gonna be, in our case, three. So the third piece is C, or is three. So that's pretty easy. Now, when I say explicitly, we're gonna use only one law at a time. So I'm gonna go limit of four times x squared. I'm going constant multiple rule. So I'm gonna break the four out first. Four times lim x approaches two of x squared plus what rule can I use for this first limit? Limit of x cubed. I got no constant multiple to worry about. What rule did you write down that we can use? Which one? Powers. Power rule. So this is limit of x. Limit x approaches 2 of x cubed. So this is take the limit of x and then cube it. So this is the power rule. All right, what is the limit of x as x approaches 2? So we're going to actually evaluate this first limit. I don't want to scroll up again, but this is the identity function. So what do we have for this limit? When x is approaching 2, x is cubed. Well, don't worry about the cube. We're just going inside the parentheses right now. So it's going to be something cubed. So I need to know what that something is. So we'll scroll back up to identity right there. So we're using this, lim x. Uh, as x approaches a is a right there. So we're using the identity rule. And we're going to use this a few times. So in our case, x is approaching 2. So this is just 2 is our limit. Now I'm going to use power, the limit power law here. Lim x approaches 2 of x squared. And we have the same exact limit that we had before. So this is our identity limit. Limit x approaches 2 of x is just 2. And 2 cubed, whatever that is, 4 times 2. All right, add these together. Something like that. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just said. So you got 8 plus 16, 24 minus 3. 21. I just didn't, I saw two cubed and I saw two squared, so I factored. Oh, okay. I pretty much always factor, so I don't have to multiply big numbers. Saves, usually saves quite a bit of brain power for when you need it. Weird math. So we'll do. Can I ask a question? No. Yeah, you can. Since like the limit's negative 
You could either add a negative 3 or subtract 3. You could do either one. But you don't add 3. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, this 2, there's no 2 negatives. No, there's no 2 negatives. So the other option is I could have done, instead of that, I could have done plus lim, um, oops, negative 3 as x approaches 2. And that would have been plus a negative 3. So you can go either way on that. Does, does that answer your, your question? So I know that this is painstakingly slow. Believe me, we're not going to move this pace for very long. So we're just going really slow. So we apply each limit law uh, one at a time. So that's what I meant by explicitly. So we're going to go very slowly at first. All right, next example, lim x approaches, we'll go negative 1, that's easy. So what law should I use first? There's only like seven laws. Quotient. I'm going to need some, but first, the biggest thing happening is we're dividing polynomial divided by polynomial. So we got quotient going on. So I can rewrite this as basically limit numerator. X approaches negative 1 of x to the fourth plus x squared minus 1 divided by limit x approaches negative 1 x squared plus 5. So I want you right now to figure out numerator limit, denominator limit. They're not hard to do. It should be super easy. Just make sure you square your negative correctly. Two wrongs make a right when you multiply. All right, questions on one sixth. So this should seem a little weird, but overall very easy what we're doing. I'll make sure it's not easy tomorrow. <laughs> 